Good morning. This is Bill from Auto Europa Naples, and today I have this very attractive. You know what else I have today? I've got a bird up there staring at me. I've got this humid, muggy, nasty air that's not moving at all. I mean, you just set it outside for a second that you're dripping. Uh, you know, this is the worst time of the year for Naples, Florida. And all of you people who get out of here, you're lucky. You're lucky. I don't care what it is up north. I don't care how bad the, you know, pollution is or, you know, the evilness up there. Doesn't matter. Down here, it is muggy and nasty. We have, that could be a mosquito. That doesn't necessarily have to be a bird. Could definitely be a mosquito. Anyway, uh, I do have this 1999 Porsche 911 Carrera 4. Uh, this is what's uh, affectionately known as a 996 model, probably one of the more controversial models, if not the most controversial model in Porsche history. One could argue the Boxster or the Cayenne has that uh, you know, distinction. But uh, anyway, this was the first water-cooled Porsche. And uh, as such, uh, I should say, sorry, the first water-cooled 911. And uh, as such, it was destined to be controversial. I mean, Porsche could have made this thing, you know, faster. It could handle better. It could break better. It could be an all-around better car with more civilized climate control. And Pura still would have. Okay, well, it did do all those things. And Pura still hated it. And, uh, you know, they continue to hate it today. And frankly, the prices on these things have depressed, in part because of the uh, ongoing controversy over the uh, the water-cooled, of course, the Boxster-style headlamps, and the infamous IMS bearing. So uh, we'll touch on all of that today. Uh, this particular example, again, is 99. It's one of the rare Carrera 4s. They didn't make too many of those in 99. Uh, the precursor, the narrow-body precursor to the 4S, which uh, was a essentially a depressurized turbo. Uh, this is a local car owned by a very, uh, very nice, very pleasant, affluent Porsche enthusiast who bought it brand new in 99, uh, serviced it very, very faithfully at the dealership, uh, brought it to us afterwards for years and years of service, uh, drove it very, very properly. It was not a garage queen, but uh, it also didn't get uh, beat to hell. Uh, just absolutely the perfect level of driving for a 911. Uh, you know, he's uh, ordered it in a terrific color combination. It's pastel yellow outside with black leather inside. Uh, it's uh, it's just gorgeous. It's been garage since new. Uh, he had the dealer put on these 19-inch Moda wheels. I don't even want to tell you what that cost. And uh, has kept them uh, beautifully as well. Has very fresh Michelins on there. Uh, this is the kind of guy you want to buy a Porsche from. Uh, you know, he knows how to use it. He knows how to drive it. He knows how to exercise it. And he also knows how to maintain it to perfection, cosmetically and mechanically. So uh, what a terrific car. I see we've been ant on it. It drives me nuts. Anyway, what a good-looking piece. So Porsche did retain so much of what, uh, you know, made the 911 attractive to people for all these years. You know, it's sort of, if you squint, does look like a Beetle. Uh, you know, but that said, it is an all-new chassis. If you go back to 1998 and get a, you know, a 993 model air-cooled car uh, with, with some sheet metal and a little bit of work and some labor and some guy who's complaining, you can eventually make it look like a 1973 model without too much fuss. Uh, ditto a 1973 model, you can bolt on all the 98 stuff and make it look like a 98. Well, not so with this car. This was Porsche's first all-new 911 underneath and on top. And uh, that was a very big deal. One of the reasons being Porsche had to move from being the supplier of sort of strange, long past their life, air-cooled, you know, development into a modern car company that had different models and, uh, you know, water-cooled vehicles that uh, passed emission standards and, uh, you know, could be sold to a wider market. And they did do that. And the 911, this 996 was kind of the first of the, of the, uh, of the stuff to come. You know, later on, the Cayenne came out. And of course, that sells more than uh, all the 911s. And, uh, you know, now they're building Panameras, which uh, is kind of a, you know, descendant of the uh, original 928, 
Uh, of course, that was the car originally destined to replace the 911, but uh, you know the purists did away with that. So uh, anyway, rambling about all that stuff, here it is. Uh, You've got these front headlights, which uh, were, came off a concept car from Porsche called the Panamericana or something like that. Uh, first appeared on the Boxster and then on the 911. And of course, the purists hated that. They don't want their 911 to look like a Boxster. Well, I mean, that doesn't bother you know Mercedes SL drivers when an SLK has essentially the front end. But of course, the Mercedes purists aren't quite as obnoxious as the Porsche guys. So uh, anyway, there's reason number one why these cars represent a terrific bargain today. Uh, reason two is, the, uh, of course, the uh, water-cooled problem. Uh, God forbid that Porsche join the, uh, the latest century and you know, get away from all the air-cooled cars out there and start building one rare water-cooled car. <laughs> No, in fact, pretty much everything in the world is water-cooled, and there's a reason for that. I mean, you want to have good air conditioning in Florida. You want to have good cooling in the Alps. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that cars basically have to have. So uh, to do this, Porsche went to Toyota, which, you know, again, they say that with uh, a derogatory spin on their accent. But uh, that said, Toyota is a great company to go to if you want to learn how to build very reliable, well-put-together cars, because that's what Toyota does very well. So with a little bit of help from Toyota, out came the 996. And, uh, you know, the automotive press instantly loved it. Uh, you know, it was fast, it handled well, it was comfortable, it had ice cold air conditioning. And, uh, you know, on their long term tests, everybody wanted to drive it with good reason. Uh, just a terrific, terrific car. <clears throat> Let's start inside the hatch here and get into this IMS bearing thing. So if you're shopping for one of these, chances are you've come across the IMS bearing controversy. And uh, there's a little bit of truth to it and a little bit of fiction. Now, this 99 model had a double row uh, roller IMS bearing. And what that bearing is, is uh, it sort of holds the intermediate shaft in place. And an intermediate shaft is something that runs the length of the engine and makes the chains that turn the cam spin at a lower rate. And what that does is prolong the, uh, the life of the chains. Uh, you know, IMSs have been in uh, Porsches for many, many years, even all through the air cooled, but uh, all of a sudden became controversial in this car. They've even been problematic in the air cool. Uh, but uh, that said, 9899, uh, this uh, M96 engine used a double row IMS bearing, which uh, basically has a failure rate of 1% or less, basically the same as the 997 models, which nobody really talks about IMSs on. So uh, there was a class action lawsuit for the engines that came out from, I want to say, 01 to 05. Uh, this generation, this M96, was excluded because the failure rate was just too low. So uh, if you're going to buy a 96 and uh, you don't want to worry about an IMS bearing, this uh, early uh, you know, version, the 99, is a pretty damn good way to go, uh, particularly if the car doesn't do one of three things, and that is sit in the garage and not get used. Uh, you know, the Porsches don't like to be garage queens. They like to be exercised. Uh, secondary to that is just deferring maintenance, which may Makes no sense at all. Uh, I mean, let me get this ant off here. It's making me nuts. It's probably on me. Uh, anyway, uh, don't defer maintenance. I mean, don't wait two years or 10,000 miles for an oil change. Keep the oil fresh. Uh, I don't care if the car doesn't get miles on it. Uh, you know, uh, fresh oil is the way to go, especially if the car doesn't get driven much and doesn't get an opportunity to evaporate some of the fuel that ends up in the oil and the carbon. So uh, keep your oil fresh. And then the third scenario is that it's an absolute track dog and you're taking the thing out to the racetrack beating the living hell out of it all the time and uh, you know uh, that will eventually uh, you know cause uh, equipment failure as it basically will on any car uh, you know and here's what you do if you want to do that just buy a Miata it's the only car out there that can take that kind of abuse on the track and keep coming back for more uh, but if you're going to own a 911, you're going to drive it regularly, you're going to service it regularly, you're going to keep everything nice and fresh, then the IMS issue probably won't apply to you. And uh, if it's something that you're going to worry about, which, you know, frankly, I don't. I think a bit of a cottage industry has been made out of this IMS thing. There's guys making a lot of money on it. And, uh, you know, they're not wrong. I mean, there is IMS failures. But, uh, you know, what they've done is created an absolute panic among the uh, entire community. And uh, everyone's 
running out to replace their uh, IMS bearings. Uh, and truly, at the end of the day, who do you want putting in your IMS bearing? You know, some you know very well-paid guy in Stuttgart who does it for a living, uh, you know, and only it for a living, or you know, some you know local wrench with a drug and alcohol problem who may or may not tap the thing into the right level. So uh, anyway, give a little more thought to the IMS bearing issue than just being scared about it. And if you want to start with the uh, <clears throat> with the most pure way of doing it, then get one of these 99 models because they are uh, the least prone to failure, certainly on the same level as the 997. So uh, 02 to 05, yeah, when you change a clutch, go ahead and change the bearing and the rear main seal. Can't hurt. But uh, anyway, don't go into a panic over the damn thing. Uh, this again, M96, first flat six uh, water-cooled engine from Porsche, puts out about 296 horsepower, retains much of the mechanical uh, loveliness that flat sixes have, sort of the weird sounds, the whirring, the clanking, uh, you know, all very nice and lovely. You see this one has stainless steel exhaust, nice option on the car, and uh, everything lovely and proper back there. Have a look under the hood. Oh, this guy here is a uh, electronic uh, spoiler that will pop up as you're going down the road. Uh, keeps the rump end planted. All very nice. <clears throat> okay, so in here <clears throat> we have a <clears throat> excuse me, pretty good trunk. You can see I've also got donuts for the guys. Must be Friday, and uh, everything uh, lovely under there. Now, you do lose some of the trunk space that other non-all-wheel drive 911s have because of that front differential hump there. Uh, but that said, it's a nice deep well. you got plenty of place to put a couple of soft bags. A weekend trip, not a problem. Uh, you can see I've very neatly uh, arranged all of my stuff. I didn't want to offend any Porsche files who like everything to be equidistant from each other. And uh, you got the original floor mats there, everything nice, very lovely. Uh, I'm not going to waste too much time with the sticker. This is the build sheet on the car. I'll zoom on it for a second, uh, and you can hit pause if you want to see that. But we do have a window sticker with that one, and that'll be posted with the photos. Now, to close that hood, or frunk, as I hate to call it, just let it click down like that, put your palm on the emblem, and give it a little push. And then you won't dent your car up. Uh, you can see these headlights, they're a real testament to the way this car's been kept. God, that's one noisy thing. What the hell is this coming? Cement truck. Nice to see the economy going. Uh, anyway, these headlights have not been restored, they've not been sanded and painted, they've not been buffed out. These are 100% original and uh, a genuine testament to the way this guy kept this car. Uh, ditto the wheels, no curb rash. Look at the brakes, he doesn't even have rust on the rotors. I mean, everything has rust on the rotors. The calipers are perfection. Uh, beautiful Moda wheels on this car, 19 inch, just absolutely gorgeous. And again, you know, it is all 911. You can cry about the headlights, you can cry about the Boxster front end, but Porsche did do a lovely job of retaining the classic 911 shape in this updated car. Car. They even raked the windshield back a little bit, which is quite nice. Okay, so inside you can see how nice that black leather contrasts with the pastel yellow. Uh, you've got your career for badging, again signifying that all-wheel drive setup, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, you've got lovely well-fitted door panels, presumably uh, half-engineered by Toyota. Oh god, how they hate that. Uh, there's no scratching on this leather-covered thing here. All beautiful. You've got a side air peg, again with no scratching. Lovely jet thruster-looking door poles inside. Very simple mirror. Uh, adjustment up there. You know, very Spartan, our 911s, and that's a good thing, and they did retain that. Uh, you know, Porsche got a lot of crap for making the interiors too simple or too cheap in this car, but I think they were certainly trying to go for the purity that they thought purists demand, so uh, I guess not. Now they've all got crazy rocker switches and flipper switches, and uh, they've become much more like uh, Gran Turismo cars than true, pure sports cars. Uh, this one does have a very nice option, and that is dual power seat it's something 
anodyne like in a 911. Uh, you know, that said, maybe the purity does demand manual seats, but yeah, the hell with that. I like sitting down and being very precise, very simply with how I like to sit. And they are very comfy, very supportive seats that do a nice job of balancing, you know, holding you in there and feeling very comfortable on a long trip. So kudos to the seat engineers on that one. Uh, back here, nobody, the guy didn't have kids, so nobody sat back here, which is fantastic because kids can be absolute savages when they're in a car. Uh, you know, you're going to be able to fit a couple people in here, which is more than you can say about earlier 911s. It was a little bit longer and wider, this car. Uh, those two seat tops do flip down and give you a giant cargo area back there where you can stuff more suitcases or cargo or, you know, whatever it needs, uh, whatever you need for your weekend trip. So everything real lovely in the back. No fading on the carpet, beautiful black leather. Ah, things just mint. God, this guy was really, really anal about this car. Uh, let's hop in. Dig the key out. I'd love to get some AC going, but the fan's probably too loud. Do it anyway. All right, with the door open, you hear that six fire up, and it does give you all the stuff that Porsche guys like, that, you know, the whirring, the clanging, the big dramatic flare up. It just uh, does sound like a 911. Let's see the going on. Park break off. Go through a couple things. All right, the hell with it. The fan's loud, I don't care. I need a little cold air. Uh, now, you see a beautifully laid out instrument cluster here. This is very classic Porsche. You've got your uh, voltmeter to the left. You've got your 175 mile an hour speedo, which is not at all ambitious. Uh, you've got your uh, 7,000 uh, redline uh, RPM tack there, right dead center in the middle. Nice place for it. Uh, you got your water and fuel one over and then your oil pressure on the uh, the far right. So a very nicely laid out instrument cluster, uh, perfect for at a glance, you know, uh, instrument checks. Uh, this little warning light there is for the rear spoiler. Uh, it's a self-test, it goes off about two seconds into your drive, so uh, that'll be gone in a second. Uh, beautiful leather rep steering wheel, you know, the ultimate in simplicity, nice to grip, immaculate. Uh, the way this guy kept his car, again, fantastic. Over here you've got your headlamps, uh, parks, full on, pull once for front fog, pull twice for rear fog. Uh, if you're one of those guys that likes to run around with your fogs on, and I get it, believe me. Don't pull it twice because the rear fog is essentially a single brake light on one side and looks ridiculous. Okay, uh, again, you know, some complaints about the dashboard looking like the Boxster. Well, I mean, it was a Porsche corporate thing at the time, so I don't know what you expected it to look like, but uh, there it is. I like the weird sort of double round speakers up there. Uh, you know, it's not the most expensive looking material they use, but it's fine. It bolts together uh, to Porsche quality. You can debate whether it's befitting of what was then a, you know, $80,000, $85,000 car, but, uh, you know, either way, it stays together and looks nice. You got this giant kind of ludicrous hazard switch up there. No reason for it to be that big. Uh, very nice climate control here. Uh, you can go through the, um, you know, uh, sometimes you see these all worn out and blown out. I don't know if this thing ever failed for the guy, but uh, if it did, it was instantly replaced. Uh, there were a lot of complaints about the radio with the tiny buttons that were kind of indecipherable. People didn't like that the CD was buried behind this flip down plate that could be pulled off for security. Uh, but, uh, you you know, the radio works, it sounds good, and uh, you know, they got a bunch of speakers, all very nice. You got some CD storage here, a uh, little bin to put your stuff. You got your uh, wiper controls here. What is that, the rear wiper? I don't think it has a rear wiper, so uh, I don't know. You got a wiper control there. You got another one here. That's probably just wash. Uh, a cigarette lighter if you're a smoker. Rear defrost, uh, you know, lock and unlock. And here we have PSM, the Porsche Stability Management. Uh, now, that was uh, key to these all-wheel drive cars, the Carrera 4s, uh, because what that did was, uh, you know, bring on this fantastic traction control uh, into an incredibly grippy car to begin 
with. Uh, you know, when these things were sent out to the automotive press, they told them, you know, go out there, uh, you know, push the thing beyond its limits, get it into a skid, which is really hard to do in an all-wheel drive 911, by the way. They grip so well, good luck to you breaking it loose. But breaking loose they did. And uh, what would happen is the PSM would break individual wheels to get the car righted again, to straighten it out, to bring it back on track. And uh, it just is a fantastic system uh, that's going to keep you and the car safe. Now, it won't work if you're airborne, so try not to let that happen. But otherwise, it works, uh, you know, fantastically well. Uh, now, it does, again, have this all-wheel drive system. Under normal circumstances, it's essentially rear-wheel rear, uh, rear drive. It's like 90% back, 10% uh, front. Uh, you know, as you get into needing traction, it can run up to 40% front. So, uh, you know, it does vary according to the car's uh, current conditions. And if you're one of these guys that wants a sports car to drive on your long, twisty road, you know, that's lovely in summer and slippery and lethal in winter, then there's going to be no better car in the world to do that in. No better sports car than this all-wheel drive Carrera 4. It's just the ultimate uh, machine for that. And it's beyond just how good it is. I mean, I'm sure there's some Subarus out there that, you know, grip the same. But there's something about doing it in, a you know, this rump engine 911 that's just a damn classic. So... All right, let's see if we can get our defrost off the front. Let's go for a spin. Uh, what am I gonna, how the hell, you know, I don't think I've done a manual with this camera yet. How the hell am I gonna do this? I'm gonna have to change hands. All right, we'll give that a shot. All right, we'll see. Here we go, bear with me. It's gonna be weird, never even thought about that. Okay, so in this beautifully maintained car, everything feels nice, tight, together, lovely. Uh, you know, the clutch is in fantastic shape. It's been driven by a guy. I'm gonna have to left-hand shift. It's gonna be weird. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, it just feels terrific. You feel so connected to the road in this car. The steering is precise. Now it does have power steering. That was another thing that really ticked off the purists. Imagine that power steering in a car, good lord. Yeah, just with this camera, I can't go nuts in a corner. This is terrible. It's a good way to get me to behave in traffic. There's nothing like hearing that big six behind you, you know, it's just, again, I think going back to the earliest 9-11s, right, this is going to be ugly, left-handed. You start hearing all that induction noise. Oh my God, what a lovely feeling. And that, my friends, is pure 911. Say what you want about the 996, say what you want about, uh, you know, the air cooled's better. Whatever, fine. You know, if a 97993 with 47,000 miles is worth 70 grand or 60 grand, uh, you know, and I just don't have that kind of budget, then I'm going to be very happy getting this thing in the 20 ish, uh, 20 -ish range, having the same thrills, uh, except I'm a little bit faster, I stick to the road a little bit more, I handle better, and uh, the air conditioning is ice cold. So uh, this thing's all 911 at a terrific price point. Uh, if you have an interest, give us a call, 239-649-7300, on the web at Mercedes Expert. Look, he's missing some letters. We've got a range for...